So this is a video on chapter 23, the respiratory system. Um, so what's the respiratory system for? It's really about getting oxygen into us and getting carbon dioxide out of us. We need oxygen for aerobic respiration for making ATP and the, the waste product of that is carbon dioxide and so that has to be gotten rid of. Um, and the respiratory system provides the means for that exchange. Uh, in So um, this is a system of, of tubes and pipes from the nose and passageways down through the neck and into the trunk and into your lungs, which are located in your thorax. Um, there are uh, most of these passageways, and by the way, the lumen of these passageways are outside of the body, so it's still outside of you, uh, are just conductive pathways. The, ex the site of exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide happens within the alveoli of the lungs. Now, detection of odors, uh, there's an olfactory receptor in the a superior nasal cavity, but that was covered during special senses um, of the nervous system. S sound production, your speaking voice, is kind of uses the respiratory system because it's the movement of air that that we utilize for that, vocal cords, etc. So we tend to think of it, especially from a clinical point of view, as the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. And it's basically at the pharynx. It's at where the, um, the digestive system and um, respiratory system deviate off. So um, right at the larynx. So the upper respiratory tract is the nose, the nasal cavities, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the laryngeopharynx, right to the larynx. The lower tract is the larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, right to the alveoli. Now, the smallest bronchioles of the conducting zone is called the terminal bronchiole. And everything from the terminal bronchiole to the nose above the terminal bronchioles is considered conducting zone. And this is air that has to be moved, but doesn't get involved with gas exchange. Distal to the terminal bronchioles, are the respiratory bronchioles and the alveoli. And these have a blood supply and, and blood capillaries and very thin walls, so they facilitate the diffusion and the exchange of these gases. So again, the conducting zone, no gas exchange, respiratory zone, gas exchange. The transition is, that, is at the terminal bronchioles. Terminal means the end. So the end bronchioles. So upper and lower respiratory tract. And we talk about that as uh, from a clinical point of view, like we have an upper respiratory tract infection versus a lower respiratory tract infection, that kind of thing. Um, from a, as a physiologist, we would prefer to talk about conducting and respiratory zones. Okay, so we start at the nose. Now, the nose uh, is really a conducting structure for breathing in. Uh, it's, there's bone involved, there's hyaline cartilage involved, some 
dense irregular connective tissue, etc. The bridge of your nose is there's a pair of bones called the nasal bones. Um, there's some lateral cartilages. Your nostrils, or nares, is dense irregular connective tissue. So if you look at the, the picture, this part's bone, this part's cartilage, and this part's connective tissue. That's why you want to pierce in here rather than the hyaline cartilage. Um, now the nasal cavity is right behind that. So just inside be the nostrils is the nasal vestibule. And this is where the hairs are. This is... Um, this is the part you think of as your nasal entrance. Um, on the superior part of the nasal cavity, there is uh, an olfactory region, and it has olfactory epithelium, and uh, the olfactory nerve enters there. Uh, but most of the rest of it is kind of this pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So it's pseudostratified and it's ciliated. There are, there are lots of goblet cells that produce copious amounts of mucus and the cilia sweep the mucus back towards the pharynx. Um, when you um, when you get that inflamed and the cilia stop moving, that's when your nose runs. The, there is a very highly vascular uh, network just below this mucosa because there's lots of superficial vessels. And that's because part of the job of the nose is to warm any air that you breathe in and to humidify the air. So we, need, we use blood to do both of those things. That's why people are prone to nosebleeds. The nasal cavity goes all the way back almost to the spine. If you look at it right here, uh, this is right where the first vertebrae is, right there. So all of this is the nasal cavity. Um, it's thrown into these folds. Uh, there are these, these folds here, here, and there, called the nasal conchi, the superior nasal, middle, and inferior nasal conchi. Or sometimes they're called the turbinate bones. Their job is to be like a Dyson vacuum cleaner and spin the air as the air passes through. Spinning the air will take any dust that's in the air and throw it to the sides where it sticks to the mucus, sticks to the snot. And the passageway for air to go through is called the meatus. So the superior meatus is here, the middle meatus is there, and the inferior meatus is there. So between the superior conche and the middle conche is the superior meatus. Between the middle and the inferior is the middle. And then between the inferior and the palate is the uh, inferior meatus. The olfactory region is right up above and in front of the uh, superior meatus. You'll notice that the frontal bone and the nasal bone, or the frontal bone and the ethmoid bone and the sphenoid bone have got um, cavities in them, so those, those are sinuses. And you'll also notice that there is a very, very thin plate in the ethmoid bone here between the brain and the upper part of the nose. So there's tear ducts are in in the corners of your eyes, and the they there are these ducts that drain into your, your nose so that your tears don't run down the front of your face normally unless you're producing more than these nasolacrimal ducts can carry. Most of this liquid ends up in your nose. That's why when you cry, your nose runs because you're watering down the mucus. 
So the nasal cavity warms, cleans, and humidifies the air. All of these blood vessels bring heat and cause warmth. The mucus traps the dust and anything else. Uh, there are cilia that's going to sweep mucus with trapped dust and pathogens and that into the pharynx where you're going to swallow it and reuse the proteins and etc. And it's a moist environment because moist air is better for diffusion of gases than dry air. So right behind the nasal cavity is the nasopharynx. And the nasopharynx is kind of a funnel-shaped pathway. Um, it's above the soft palate and the uvula, which is the little thing that hangs down at the back of your throat. Um, the, the nasopharynx uh, is, has the same epithelium as the nose. So it's a pseudostratified ciliated uh, epithelium. There's a little tonsil there uh, called the, uh, the, it's the adenoids. There's a, um, and there's two little passageways that go to behind the ears called the um, eustachian tubes. Behind the mouth, it's the oropharynx. <clears throat> and so the transition between the nasopharynx and the oropharynx is really one of um, epithelium type. The oropharynx and the laryngeopharynx have stratified squamous epithelium because food is abrasive and food uh, passes through this area, so the epithelium has to deal with that. The laryngeopharynx is kind of right behind the epiglottis, right there, right at the larynx. So I've already said this, but the superior part is the nasopharynx. Uh, there's the eustachian tubes. There is some tubal tonsils and the pharyngeal tonsils the adenoids um, and it's a passage for air so therefore pseudostratified ciliated epithelium the oropharynx is food and air stratified squamous epithelium with no keratin there's tonsils there as well the laryngeopharynx is behind the larynx and again it's both food and air. Now, the lower respiratory tract is from the larynx all the way down to the terminal bronchioles. Um, the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. So the larynx we call it the Adam's apple or the, the voice box. It has a couple of functions. It is the switching system. Um, it's what the air makes the air go down one passageway, food go down a different. And so there's a lid that goes over the top of the trachea called the epiglottis. And that is part of the larynx. The vocal cords are also found here, and the vocal cords are like guitar strings almost, and they get strummed and they, they vibrate, they make noise. So the larynx has mostly, it's this switching mechanism that matters. You can actually close off the epiglottis on purpose and when you exhale against that and don't let the air out it's called the valsalva maneuver and what that ends up doing is it pushes down on the diaphragm which makes the abdominal cavity smaller which is increases the pressure and it's useful 
for helping with defecation. It also helps with urination because it pushes on the outside of the bladder and it helps with childbirth. So bearing down is really a function of the larynx. The larynx is also um, very sensitive. So it, it's where you get your cough and reflexes. Less sneezing, that's more in the nose, but it, it's, um, it blasts air out if there is irritants in that air. Um, there's a whole bunch of cartilage here. We're not going to learn the names of them. Uh, what we really care about is more the epiglottis. And think of the epiglottis here, almost like a garbage can lid. The trachea is here, and the epiglottis comes down and blocks the top of the trachea when you're swallowing, and it lifts up and opens the trachea when you're breathing. Now the trachea is an open tube that connects the larynx to the primary bronchi. Now, there are cartilages that hold this tube open the same way that there are wires that are in a vacuum cleaner hose or in a dryer hose that hold it open because it facilitates the passage of air. And these, so there's these kind of C-shaped rings of cartilage called the tracheal cartilage. We find this in front of the esophagus right? and running down the bottom part of your neck and mostly it's behind the sternum. There's a little muscle that, uh, that closes off that C-shaped thing, uh, the C-shaped rings and it's called the tracheal's muscles. And so when you're actually swallowing, the esophagus bulges into the trachea and then the tracheal's muscle pushes it out. Um, at the bottom of the trachea, there's this little ridge where the trachea is going to branch into the primary bronchi left and right. And it's covered with nerve endings that cause you to cough when irritants are present. Um, it's why people that inhale some smoke, for instance, and try to hold it in their lungs for whatever reason, end up going <coughs> <coughs> make that coughing noise. It's the carnia that does it. So it looks like this. There's the C-shaped ring, there's the esophagus, the tracheal's muscle is here. Um, very regular, right down in the carnea, is down here. Now, the bronchi, the bronchial tree, is really branches off of the trachea. The primary bronchia bronchi, left and right, enter each lung. Now we're going to see that lungs have lobes and so the primary bronchi will send a branch to each lobe, three on the right, two on the left, and those would be called the secondary bronchi or the lobar bronchi. Then that becomes branches into the tertiary bronchi, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The bronchi keep on branching, so we have more of them, each one getting smaller, but the total cross-sectional area getting bigger. So the secondary bronchi go to each lobe, and they go further and further, so into each segment, which is the tertiary bronchi, and then etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Eventually we stop naming them and we get down to these real small things called bronchioles leading to the terminal bronchioles. Now 
there are 23 levels of branching. I don't know why it's not a number that I expect you to know, but I but to give you a sense of it. So they keep on getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And more and more of them. We're not going to worry about um, any of the pathologies of this. So the original primary bronchi and the secondary bronchi have cartilage rings just like the trachea that keep them open. Um, the walls, so the lumen is fairly large. The, the epithelium is a pseudostratified ciliated epithelium with mucus and the cilia move the mucus up and up the trachea and they dump it out so that you can bring it down the esophagus. It comes out at the larynx. Um, as you go further and further down the tree, there's less and less cartilage and there's more and more muscles in the walls till we get to the bronchioles and they have a thicker layer of smooth muscle and they can actually constrict or dilate to allow more or less resistance and really direct where the air is moving in the lungs. We send air to the parts of the lungs that we're sending blood to and vice versa. It's, uh, it's called uh, ventilation perfusion coupling. So starts out with all this cartilage, less and less cartilage, until we get down to the bronchioles, which have smooth muscle walls. There's a bronchial dilated and a bronchial constricted view. We use bronchial constriction to not let irritants get to a certain part of the lungs, and if that reflex is too uh, sensitive, it can lead to asthma. Um, again, we're not going to worry about that. We'll worry about that in a pathology course. So we get smaller and smaller and smaller until we get to the terminal bronchioles. Then we have the respiratory bronchioles. And really, these are very small vessels, but there are millions of them. So the total cross-sectional area is huge. Now, the difference between the terminal bronchioles and the respiratory bronchioles is really the presence of blood capillaries and the ability to exchange gases. Now, the respiratory bronchioles divide up, they branch up into things called alveolar ducts. And alveolar ducts leads to these clusters of alveoli called alveolar sacs. And an alveolar, which means grape or berry, is just that. It's this, this little sack with very thin walls that allow for gas exchange. It looks like this. It looks like a, almost like a bunch of grapes. So the bronchiole is here. The terminal bronchioles are here. The respiratory bronchioles are here, where we're starting to get the capillary beds. These are the alveolar ducts. This is an alveolar sac with all the different alveoli. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that all of these levels of branching of the bronchioles, there's a corresponding branching of the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins. Um, so every one of these, so the pulmonary artery coming from the right ventricle will branch right alongside all of these bronchioles. And then when it goes through the capillaries, it's all picked up by the pulmonary veins, which keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger and coming together to end up being the pulmonary veins. The 
there are 300 to 400 million alveoli and they're all interconnected in within each sac through these little pores so you can have collateral ventilation they're surrounded by capillary beds now there are interalveolar septum so that is that walls that separate these alveolar sacs from one another that is made up of primarily elastic connective tissue uh, so that's why the lung is so rubbery and and really can act like a balloon now the walls of the alveoli at least the type 1 cells in there are simple squamous epithelial cells and they're very very thin and the walls of the capillaries are simple squamous endothelial cells epithelial cells that are very very thin and the two of them are glued together by a secretion called the basement membrane and and the so these two cells, the type 1 cells and the endothelial cell and the basement membrane fusing them is called the respiratory membrane. And it's only half a micron thick. Um, and so it facilitates diffusion. Oxygen will leave the alveoli and go into the blood because of pressure gradients. And carbon dioxide leaves the blood and goes into the alveoli again because of pressure gradients. So this is what it looks like. This, this is a type 1 cell. Oxygen literally goes through the two cells in the basement membrane to get into the blood. Carbon dioxide literally comes the other way because it's so thin. Huge amount of surface area because there's 400 million of these things. Now, in this picture, you'll also see these cells here. These cells are called type 2 alveolar cells. And they produce something called surfactant. We'll look at that in, in a couple of minutes. These are the capillary beds in through here, passing right around. And the other thing that there is in here are macrophages. And that's because there's no cilia, so anything that gets in this deep into your lungs that shouldn't be there, the alveolar macrophages engulf it, and then they literally crawl out and get trapped in the mucus and then swept up by, by the cilia in the larger bronchi. but they're there for a protective mechanism. When we look at each lung, there's the costal surfaces on the ribs, there's the mediastinal surfaces on, to the mediastinum, and then the bottom is touching the diaphragm, so that's the diaphragmatic surface. On the medial side, on the mediastinal side, uh, there's an indentation called the hilum. It's through the hilum that the bronchi, the nerves, lymphatic vessels, and the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary veins all pass. They're found on either side of the mediastinum, filling the whole thorax from the diaphragm to the upper part of the cavity. The apex of the lung is all the way up here behind your collarbones. And it extends all the way down to your diaphragm. So the right lung is larger because the heart is taking up room on the left side. The, the right lung has three lobes and therefore two fissures separating the lobes. There's a horizontal fissure and an oblique fissure. There's a superior, middle, 
an inferior lobe. On the left side, there's only two lobes and one fissure. So there's an oblique fissure with a superior and an inferior lobe. There is a cardiac notch uh, and a cardiac impression to accommodate the heart. So if we look at it, oblique fissure, oblique fissure. Superior, middle, and inferior, superior and inferior lobe with the cardiac notch here. This is the hilum where everything enters and leaves the lungs. Now, the lobes are pretty close to the same size because they are, they are kind of wedged in there. And, uh, and from any view, you don't see the whole lobe. Because the lungs are the area of gas exchange with the car cardiovascular system, we need to bring blood to the lungs to exchange the gases. And that's the pulmonary circulation. That is from the right ventricle through the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary arteries, the oxygenated blood, and then they branch and branch and branch and branch through the pulmonary capillaries, and then the pulmonary veins going all the way back to the left atrium. But there's also a bronchial circulation, and that's because the, the lungs themselves need to be, they need a blood supply because those are living cells. So off of the aorta, will be a bronchial artery that goes to the lungs and brings oxygenated nutrient rich blood to the lungs and then there's bronchial veins that drain it now it's it's interesting because the the bronchial arteries are fairly large and they're fairly robust and they they branch off the aorta themselves the bronchial veins are less well developed because they kind of anastomose with the pulmonary veins. And so the pulmonary veins are bringing mostly oxygen rich blood from the alveoli and the pulmonary circulation and some deoxygenated blood from the bronchial veins. Uh, they just, it just kind of mixes together. So this is basically a picture of that. <clears throat> now, surrounding each lung is a serous membrane called the pleura. And this is a recurring theme. The part of the pleura, it's a simple squamous epithelium. It's a kind of a double-walled bag. The part that's attached to the ribs is called the parietal pleura. It lines, it's the lateral surface of the mediastinum, this, this superior surface of the diaphragm, and lining the entire thoracic cavity. Parietal pleura. The part that's actually adhered to the surface of the lungs is called the visceral pleura. It's just like the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium. We're going to see in the digestive system there's a parietal peritoneum and there's a visceral peritoneum. Visceral means organ, so the one on the organ is the visceral. Parietal means body wall, so the one on the body wall is the parietal. In between is a space called the pleural space or the pleural cavity, and it's filled with fluid. Now, when the lungs are inflated, that space isn't very big, uh, but it still has some fluid in there. They're almost touching. And this is really important uh, for the mechanics of breathing, which we will be talking about in the next video. You need to have this pleural cavity 
to have just a little bit of fluid. You don't want any air or any blood in it or else you end up with a collapsed lung. But again, we're not worried about pathology in this course.